Do 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 do. <clears throat> Hello everyone and welcome to finally another video. Uh, I do apologize profoundly. I have been very, 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 very busy with university for the last couple of weeks. Uh, now that things have calmed down a bit for two weeks, <laughs> I thought I'd do one of the filler videos that I have prepared uh, in an earlier uh, session actually that I haven't quite finished yet. Um, I was in a live stream about two months ago from the release of this video um, where Flatoid uh, and cohorts were talking about uh, gas pressure and things like that and, and specifically applied to the ISS and there are a few things in there that I just couldn't leave uncommented that show a profound misunderstanding of the way physics works and especially in regards to pressure so without further ado Let's have a look. <laughs> and, it, yeah. and then we're in all in spaceship. And it gets sucked into it and it sucks its own body through that hole. Yeah, okay, I just got So what, what this is about is that there was a hole on the ISS and that Alexander Gerst, the astronaut that uh, found it, uh, he first plucked it with his finger and he then put some, uh, I think it's called Captain tape, I believe, uh, over it and, and, and until further repairs were done. Uh, professionally kind of and they are arguing that well uh, first of all the astronaut would have gotten sucked out of the out of the uh, uh, ISS by that and that his finger could never withhold that pressure and I was like well that's not true the the pressure difference in, in, in the comments right here flat side is hovering over it and I'm hovering over flat side hovering over it um, he says here that well, I say here that the pressure between the inside of the ISS and space is around one bar and that's not that much the difference between outside air and the car tire is like two bars and, I, and you can plug a hole there with your finger no worries whatsoever and let, so let's see what what flat side has to say to that but olaf yes just because it's one bar difference doesn't mean it's not going to uh, force itself into the available space remember that's true that's why you put your finger there remember with a one bar difference in that vacuum there's no pushback from the atmos on the outside pushing and th this is one of the points where i think uh, flat soids complete utter lack of understanding of gas comes to show really 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 nicely and i love that he thinks he can uh, explain it to other people <clears throat> he says because there doesn't there isn't a pushback from the atmosphere it makes a difference it's not just one bar it's apparently relevant if you have a pushback or not i will comment that in detail later on but he says the difference between zero and one bar would not be the same as for example one bar and two bar which <laughs> i will leave uncommented so far if there's no difference so, why do they need space yeah but but you understand what i'm saying they ignoring that let's say here on earth we got the atmo pushing out from the outside as well there you got nothing pushing back but it's still one bar which is 10 uh 100 kilopascals of pressure difference that's it that's the only relevant thing is the difference in pressure because if you have let's say you have uh, an object and in one direction there is 10 newtons of force in one case and in the other case you have 10 newtons of force in the other direction and 20 newtons of force in that direction like opposite each other the net force is still going to be 10 newton and will be indistinguishable from when there would just be acting 10 newton please tell me that you know that i you obviously don't right but <laughs> i can't believe it so that yeah. one bar difference is a huge difference especially when now it's precisely one bar <laughs> you're going to have a hole as soon as you have air rushing from one place to another it increases with pressure that, that is actually one of the very few things that he says here that are correct if you have uh, air moving through a narrower space or even a broader space there will be a change in pressure one way or the other there will also be a change in uh, velocity and because air is incom uh, is a compressible fluid uh, it will also be a change in density. I will go on to calculate those for you later to show you that I'm still right. That pressure force increases because of uh, how hydrostatics works. Well, if it's in motion, it's not hydrostatic, it's hydrodynamics, but you fail at understanding basic addition and subtraction, so I'm not surprised. Because it's a smaller hole, that air is going to force out, it's going to go quicker through, and therefore the pressure is going to increase, and therefore the rupture... 
That's correct. It will become bigger. So That's incorrect. How do you know that the rupture is going to be bigger? Did you calculate the forces acting on the material there? Do you know the shear module of the steel that they, or the aluminum or titanium or whatever they use uh, to build the ISS with? Did you calculate how much force would be acting on that and if it would be enough to cause a catastrophic disassembly? No, you're just saying that it would rupture. <laughs> You know when there's hole on airplanes sometimes that occurs right that happens there, there are uh, airplanes that have been hit by by uh, like commercial airplanes that have been hit by gunfire both accidental and and on purpose that have not immediately decompressed even though you know the shame the same thing happens there doesn't it it doesn't yeah. matter that it's just one oh but they're still atmo pressing from the outset yeah i got it sure. yeah but it's a shitty baller excuse to get out of fact that like the claim holds in iss you know. Okay, so th this is the first round of, of claims that I would like to talk about, this whole pressure thing, and I will go on and calculate and show you that indeed you could put your thumb there, this is not an issue, and that the ISS would not have decompressed immediately. Okay, so when I when Flatshot earlier said that uh, it makes a difference because you don't have the Atmo pressing against it, so this one bar is actually a huge difference, well first of all no, it's precisely one bar. And please, Flatside, do tell me if you agree. If I have an object here, this is some kind of area, I guess, some, some object, could be anything, could be a point, I draw it as a line here. If I have a line or an object that has 10 newtons of force applied in this direction, right, it is the same as if I apply 20 newtons in this direction and 10 in the other. You know that, right? It's the same with pressure, just the difference matters. We are just talking about the difference. How would I need to explain that to an adult who professes himself to be knowledgeable about these kind of things? I don't know, but this is the state of things that we are, that we are in. So, <laughs> let's go on. Uh, uh, could I plug a 22mm, I googled how big the hole was, 22mm hole with my finger on the ISS. Let's say, so the situation is, we have space here, we have the inside here at around 100 kilopascals. I googled how high the pressure is on the ISS and it's some in somewhere between 105 and 95 kilopascals. Um, so I took the average, so we say 100 kilopascals, this is also the average atmospheric pressure around there, not quite, it's a bit higher, but yeah, we don't care about that. Um, so you have space, you have the inside, there's a pressure difference of 100 kilopascals. And could I plug it with a thumb? Well, this is a very easy calculation. The force on the thumb would be, so from, from, from the pressure formula, we get the delta pressure, because we have the difference of two pressures here, would be the difference in force over the same area. So we have the difference of the force inside minus the difference of the force from the outside is equal to the pressure inside minus the pressure outside, the S here means space, would be 100 kilopascals, I said that earlier. We multiplied it with the area. The area of the hole would be pi r squared, where r is the radius of the hole, so that's 11 millimeters, and we come to force of 0 0.38 newton. That's very little force. Very, very little. <laughs> that's 38 grams. So, like a weight of 38 grams on your thumb if it was on, on Earth, right? 38 grams. That's not even a phone. That's like a tenth of a, of a smartphone. Can your thumb hold it? Yes. <laughs> yes, it can. <laughs> and by the way, mind you, flat side, once you put your thumb over it, um, there is no moving uh, gas anymore, so the pressure would just be that. But now can you say, um, by, by the way, also, it would be the same, absolute 100% same situation if we had 100 kilopascals on, on the outside and 200 kilopascals on the inside. Exactly same calculation, because here we have the difference, which, which is still 100 kilopascals, right? Okay, so, but what, what about... When Flatside said, well, the pressure increases with a narrow hole, and then... Yes. You know. It's like Aaron said, yeah, the but... pressure between space and ISIS isn't very good. Come on, guys, got to talk. But you understand just... what you're trying to say? They, they, they're so dumb, they don't understand that the gas going through a smaller hole increases the pressure. So, in other words, it gives more of a force. 
that is indeed correct. Unfortunately, the calculation here isn't too easy. <laughs> I had to I had to uh, dig up my university uh, lectures when we talked about uh, fluids and compressibility and things. Usually, we would turn to the Bernoulli equation. Unfortunately, it doesn't really apply here because the Bernoulli equation assumes an incompressible fluid, and air most definitely is compressible. So I, I looked for the compressible. Uh, uh, equivalent, which is this one here. The gamma here is uh, the relation between the heat capacity at constant pressure and the heat capacity at constant volume, uh, which for dry air at 20 degrees centigrade, which I assume it has on the ISS, 20, it, it doesn't vary a lot with temperatures. So I think this estimation is fine, um, where, where it's around 1.4. <clears throat> the P0 here is the stationary pressure, so the pressure it has on the ISS in general, like if you will, kind of prior to the hole, and there's a that's the density that the air has uh, in the stationary case, which is again prior to the to the hole, which is about 1.23 kilograms per square meter, which is the average density of air. Um, now, if we plug all of these values in, and we get the the speed of air, which I didn't specifically calculate. I do that later. I could have used that value here. But uh, it's very reasonable to assume that's the speed of sound, which is kind of, if you have an opening to vacuum, the air is going to expand out there with the speed of sound because there's nothing, uh, uh, no particles that it could uh, uh, shoot against. So speed of air is, uh, speed, speed of sound is a very reasonable approximation here. Um, and we can see that compared, the, the, the final relation between pressure and density is very similar to the one that it was before in the stationary case. So what would happen is, my according to, to, to my uh, uh, understanding of this, is the density would increase sharply uh, at the hole, not outside, but like right at the hole, the, pre the density would increase sharply and the pressure would increase only by a bit, like a couple of percent from, from, from what I would, would uh, Mention to guess, but you can see the relation is very very similar. Of course, now you could say, yeah, I can double that and double that. Yes, you could, but you won't reach the necessary density required, right? So you you uh, because the more dense you make it, the the more it will want to spring back on you. So yeah, this is no significant change change in pressure. Um, it's mostly density change, and the thing I would be entirely fine, and especially the structure of the ISS would be completely fine. There would not be a rupture. Flat said, if you think that there would be a rupture, you would need to provide the evidence that the hull of the ISS has a shear module, which is a property of material physics, has a shear module that's low enough that the little force that we can have calculated here would be able to push the material away such that it bends or uh, deconstructs completely. I will need a citation for that. Until then, uh, I think my maths is more credible than your blind speculation. <sighs> okay, how fast would the ISS run out of air? Because flat side later goes on to say that this would essentially happen instantly. I mean, when he opens the valve, he, it rushes to the mm -hmm. available space. Not, it takes its time. It's instantaneous. It's instant. Yeah. Instant. yeah. Okay, so as soon as he literally just tr opens that valve, a smudge, it already rushes to the available space. It doesn't take a sense of, oh, guys, now we have to move. And Right? They, they, it wouldn't be enough time to, oh, we need to adjust. He says it would be instantly. Well, I calculated that as well, by the way. Um, there's a NASA paper on this, where the list, this is the, this is the, the space operations manual, where they say that the lowest pressure on the ISS, that the human and the equipment, the, the pressure thresholds there are very similar. The, both the equipment and the, the people on the ISS would be able to uh, to handle. It is around uh, 65, I think, uh, kilopascals, right? Which is about two thirds of the standard pressure that you have. So what I was curious about is how fast would the air escape the ISS actually, not just assuming the speed of sound, um, and I calculated that you can calculate that by taking the relative pressure, so the difference in pressure, 
um, times the radius of the opening square divided by four times the viscosity. The viscosity for dry air at 20 degrees centigrade is that value over here. Uh, and now, usually, as we would lose air, the relative pressure would decrease. So the temperature, uh, the temperature, the the velocity of the of the air flowing out would also decrease. But I, I was calculating here with the worst case for my position, right? Because that's what you do. The worst case for my position is that V stays constant, even though the pressure decreases and it sh the V should also decrease. I'm not calculating. I'm calculating with a uh, with a constant outflow velocity of around 565 meters per second. The volumes of the ISS, excluding the air reserves, is about 916 cubic meters. <sighs> From that, you can calculate the flow rate. The flow rate is just the area of the opening times the velocity the air is flowing out of it. And well, from that you can calculate uh, that the flow rate would be around, you would lose around uh, two liters every second, two liters of air, there or thereabouts, every second, right? And when you take the volume, divide it by, by the flow rate and multiply it times one third, because we only need to re lose one third of the air pressure to get a problem, we would land at about 40 hours. So you have 40 hours of time <laughs> until the ISS will reach a dangerous area of, of uh, air pressure with, a, with the 22 millimeter hole. If you, do, if you don't find it or if you don't take any countermeasures whatsoever, you have 40 hours, excluding the reserves. You, you could shut down that module and it would have been fine. Just, just that, right? Um, now, flat saw it when, when, when uh, uh, he, he then used his most favorite uh, response, which is his flask video. I will cut it in here. I you guys to pay attention. Remember, I just got some bromine and it's got a vacuum. Now, notice that's not much difference of air pressure, okay? Bromine. When he opens the valve, he, it rushes to the mm -hmm. available space. Not, it takes its time. It's instantaneous. It's instant. yeah. Yeah. Okay? So, as soon as he literally just opens that valve, a smudge, it already rushes to the available space. It doesn't take a sense like, oh, guys, now we have to move. And in the other, I have a, a vacuum. And if I open the tap between... Now, notice he's going to touch it, at, like, literally, look, he's going to move it a, a millimeter or two, and it's already going to start rushing. Let, it's not going to wait till clear, it's open. Right? Let's be clear, that, that video that you've just shown kills space, right? Yes, no does. matter how many Baltad wants to come in and cry that it doesn't, it doesn't, that's not this, that's not, no, it kills space, mate. It's game over just with that video. Mm -hmm. So anybody wanting to come and argue for space, if you've seen that video, you've got big issues. Exactly. And it's a 50s video, you know what I mean? So, like, yeah. Hey, Jeff, hey, um, Earth is Life, thank you for And Pokey, what's up, man? Good to see you, and Charlie Walsh. But look, guys, pay attention. He's not. These two. Even he's literally going to move the valve like a millimeter. It's not going to be fully open. It's already going to rush. You can even hear the, the gas rush in. You will see spontaneously. Spontaneously. Look at that. He's look. He's literally just moved it like a millimeter. You can really start starting to go through. Rush. Whoops. From yeah. Straight away. Ooh. It equalized, and that's what would happen on your beloved ISS guy. Okay. Um... Where in the flask video he says it happens spontaneously. First of all, flattered in science, the word spontaneously doesn't mean instantly. It means kind of on its own. <laughs> so uh, a very slow process that takes hundreds of years is also spontaneously. Just, just so you know. So spontaneously doesn't mean anything. Um, just out of interest, I calculated with the same approach how fast the gas would expand with the same calculation into that vacuum right here. So I, I googled what the what the uh, conventional size of, of the openings of those volumetric flasks is. Um, and and there, there is a standard that is uh, today, that is employed today, which is uh, 34 millimeters. Now, when the, the video that Flatside showed uh, was from the 50s, I do not know if the standard was in place by then, but it will not uh, uh, deviate from this significantly. So I think uh, 34 millimeters is a very reasonable approximation. I estimated the volume of the volumetric flask to be two liters. You will see briefly that it could have, might as well have been 50 liters and it wouldn't change much. Um, and I calculated, uh, the guy in the video says that it's bromine gas in there. I didn't know if it was pure bromine gas or if you had a uh, liquid bromine in there that has uh, turned into gas, which would, would then be an air bromine mixture. I, I went to the worst case for my argument again, which would be P 
pure bromine because actually gaseous bromine is surprisingly viscous for a gas. Um, it has a, a an, an air uh, viscosity at 10 degrees centigrade of around 0.0023, uh, where the air has about 10 to the minus 5, so there's a big difference there. And the velocity would be around 125 meters per second. I also assumed standard atmospheric pressure for the bromine. Um, so 125 meters per second would be the velocity uh, times this, the area of the hole. We would get a whooping time with the same calculation as before until the two have equalized, because we only need to lose half the pressure, that's why the half is there, until the two have equalized of 8 microseconds. That's not milliseconds, that's microseconds. So, let's say your demonstration with the flasks is consistent with our maths. It doesn't, it's not in disagreement with the previous calculation whatsoever. You have no clue about gas physics, you have no clue about uh, how pressure works, glaringly obviously. And this is why, and, and I mean, even though they have no clue about my existence, I will very much support uh, your nomination and will vote for you for top left of this uh, year. So yeah, <laughs> I think that concludes the video rather nicely. I thank you very much for watching. Um, I do apologize. The videos over the next few months will be pretty spread out. I have graciously been invited to uh, an unnamed English university that a uh, professor of which has read my master's thesis and is very content with what I did and would like me to join him for a couple of months for a research project. And I have gladly agreed. So I will not have uh, access to my usual recording equipment. So I wouldn't expect that many videos for the next couple of months, like three or four months, maybe, maybe, maybe just three months. I can, I can see if I can manage a couple. <laughs> so yeah, regardless with that, I thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. If you enjoyed it a lot, maybe consider considering subscribing. Um, and with that, I will see you in the next video whenever that will be. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.